Sean Diddy Combs is locked up in a federal jail that has been plagued by harsh conditions and violence. The Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn has seen multiple deaths in recent years. It's now been one week since the arrest of Sean Diddy Combs. Diddy is now at the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn, a place that's been described as hell on earth. Everyone wants to know what happens to Diddy if he's found guilty. But what if he's never found guilty? What if he never even goes to trial? Right now, he's locked up in one of the toughest prisons in New York. And with his status and the stuff he's done, who knows what could pop off at any moment. So how much danger is he really in? How long does he gotta stay there? And the big question, what's life really like behind those bars? Here's a look at what Diddy's life has been like on the inside. Sean Combs is behind bars after a federal judge denied the music producer's request to post a $50 million bail. Diddy's life behind bars is far from the glitz and glamour of Hollywood fame and power. But before we get into more details of the nightmare he is facing right now, you need to understand that this powerful, influential man is sitting in a cell right now because a judge shut down his massive $50 million bail request. That $50 million was backed by Diddy, his mom, and other family members, but it would come with conditions like home detention and GPS tracking to make sure he wouldn't run. He was going to take weekly drug tests and log his visitors, submitting that info to pretrial services every night. His team also promised that Diddy wouldn't have access to a phone or the internet. The defense goes on saying that Diddy even flew himself to New York to turn himself in and that he could be trusted to wait for a trial at home. But but on the other hand, Diddy's prosecutors say this guy had a long history of intimidating both accusers and witnesses. They showed all kinds of messages from women claiming that Diddy threatened to expose videos of them taking part in his freak-offs and set performances he allegedly set up. They believe if they put Diddy on house arrest, he could use his power and influence to manipulate or even worse, eliminate anyone set to testify against him. So ultimately, the judge ruled that Diddy was too much of a flight risk. And that 50 million wasn't enough. Diddy was then transported to the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn. The MDC has been marked by murder, violence, and suicide for years. This Brooklyn prison had been set up in the early 90s, and it mainly holds people waiting on trial in federal courts in Manhattan or Brooklyn. Though some do serve short sentences after conviction, you can find the MDC on a gritty part of the Brooklyn waterfront with outdoor recreation areas, a medical unit, and even a dental spot. There's also a separate area for education programs and a library. And since the Metro Correctional Center in Manhattan shut down in 2021, MDC became the only federal jail in NYC, causing even more internal problems. MDC Brooklyn's been catching heat for years over how bad things are inside. Prisoners are complaining about violence, terrible conditions, lack of staff, and smuggling drugs and contraband, sometimes by the staff themselves. They've also been dealing with constant lockdowns, no phone calls, no visits, no showers, and barely any time to get outside. Now things really hit the fan back in 2019 when this electrical fire caused a week-long blackout in the middle of winter. The whole facility was pitch black and freezing, causing a lot of unrest. Federal watchdogs started raising eyebrows over the whole mess. Then in June 2020, an inmate named Jamel Floyd died after being pepper sprayed by the guards. His family went after him with a lawsuit, but the DOJ said there wasn't enough evidence of staff wrongdoing, even though they admitted the pepper spray wasn't used by the book. Since Manhattan jail closed, MDC's been overcrowded, understaffed, and straight-up dangerous. A report from the Federal Defenders of New York in 2024 points out how bad it's gotten, with drugs and contraband making things worse. However, there's more. In June 2023, 37-year-old Uriel White was stabbed to death by fellow inmates. The next month, 36-year-old Edwin Cordero was fatally injured in a fight. On top of that, at least four suicides have gone down in the past three years. I mean, if you don't get it already, the place is a show, breaking down and stripping people of their humanity. One Manhattan judge, Jesse Furman, once refused to send Chavez to MDC after he pled guilty to a drug case. The judge even said that spot was too dangerous and let Chavez wait for sentencing on supervised release. Now, the Federal Bureau of Prisons say they're trying to fix things at MDC. They've got an action team, they're hiring more staff, and they claim they're making improvements. 
but who are we kidding? Nothing's really changing over there. And if you made it this far in the video, you should pretty much know now what MDC's kind of like from the outside. But aren't you just as curious as we are about how a guy like Diddy ended up in a hell of a place like this? Between at least 2008 and the present, Combs abused, threatened, and coerced victims to fulfill his sexual desires, protect his reputation, and conceal his conduct. You're going to hear about my party. They're going to be shutting them down. They're going to probably be arresting me, doing all types of crazy things just because we want to have a good time. Back in 2022, Diddy threw a big party for his 53rd birthday at his jaw-dropping $61 million crib in Beverly Hills. All the A-listers showed up to this dope party, including Jay-Z, Travis Scott, Mary J. Blige, Kalani, Tanashi, Chris Brown, and Machine Gun Kelly. This party also marked Diddy's 30-year anniversary in the music game, a hustler building his own entertainment empire, and really changed the hip-hop scene as both an artist and a producer for legends like Mariah Carey, Jennifer Lopez, and Notorious B.I.G. But this run didn't come without some very shady past. Sean Diddy Combs, born in Harlem, but growing up in Mount Vernon, New York. His mom Janice was a teacher's assistant, and his dad Melvin was in the Air Force before becoming connected to the drug dealer Frank Lucas, inspired by the movie American Gangster. Now in 1972, his dad got shot in his car during a drug deal after someone mistook him for an informant. Sean was only two at the time, and wouldn't find out what really happened until years later. As a teenager, Combs hustled six different newspaper delivery routes before he jumped to business admin studies at Howard University. Now, while at school, Diddy built a name for himself, throwing big parties, some pulling in over a thousand guests. And after bringing people like Heavy D and Terry Riley to perform, he caught the eye of Uptown Records founder Andre Harrell, who hooked him up with an internship in New York. Diddy eventually dropped out to work full time helping kick off the careers of stars like Mary J. Blige and Jodeci. But in 1991, things took a dark turn when he co-promoted a celebrity basketball game and concert at City College in New York. Almost 5,000 people packed into a gym that could only hold 2,730, leading to a tragic crash leaving 9 dead and 29 injured. This investigation by the New York mayor's office pointed fingers at Diddy for hiring inexperienced security staff. Still, he and his lawyers argued that he wasn't in charge of security that day. No criminal charges came out of that tragedy, but the families of those who died sued the promoters, the college, and the city, claiming negligence. The case ended up settling for $3.8 million, with Diddy covering $750,000 of that. Where and how did he get that cash? We don't know. But what we do know is that from that point on, Diddy became a bona fide name in Hollywood. While at Uptown Records, Diddy signed a young Brooklyn rapper named Christopher Wallace, better yet known as The Notorious B.I.G., and began working on his first album. But things went south with his boss Harrell and Diddy got fired, and he hits back by launching his own label, Bad Boy Records, and brought Wallace along for the ride. Biggie's debut album, Ready to Die, dropped and became a legendary rap classic, selling millions and producing hits like Juicy and Big Papa. Diddy quickly built up the bad boy roster, putting out successful albums for artists like Faith Evans, Maze, 112, and Total. The label's sound was smooth and polished, sampling well-known tracks. However, in March 1997, tragedy struck when Biggie was shot in a drive-by at just 24 years old. The murder remains unsolved, but it's tying to the East-West Coast rap feud that had already taken Tupac Shakur. Diddy, who was riding in the car behind Biggie, channeled his pain into a song called I'll Be Missing You, which became one of his biggest hits in 1997. Now at this point, Bad Boy was one of the top labels in rap. Besides their own artists, big names like Mariah Carey and J-Lo wanted Diddy to remix their tracks to add that hip-hop flair. But there were some bumps along the way. May 1999, Diddy gets arrested for allegedly assaulting Interscope Records exec Steve Stout over a music video disagreement. He pled guilty to harassment and had to take this one-day anger management class. Later that year, cops would find two 9mm guns in his car after a club argument turned messy, leading to a charge of criminal possession of a weapon. Both he and his then-girlfriend Jennifer Lopez were arrested. But Diddy somehow beat those charges and Lopez wasn't charged at all. 
Back in 2003, a former president of Bad Boy Entertainment took Diddy to court, claiming that his old business partner threatened him with a baseball bat and forced him to sign over his shares of the company. Kirk Burroughs said that Diddy scared Mary J. Blige into dropping him as her manager back in 2001. Now Puff shot down those accusations, calling him total fantasy. And the appeals court would toss that case out in 2006, saying the time limit for filing had run out. So like we said, Diddy was coasting through hip-hop. And despite a few allegations here and there, he was pretty solid. Until one lady came into his life. In 2005, a young singer named Cassandra Elizabeth Ventura, known as Cassie, signed a 10-album deal with Diddy's record label, Bad Boy Records. His label then released her self-titled debut album in 2006, and she got a lot of love from critics for its futuristic R&B vibes. The two got into a relationship for a little over a decade. However, as we now know, those were probably the worst years of Cassie's life. November 2023. A civil lawsuit from Cassie claims that Diddy used his power to create a manipulative and coercive, romantic and sexual relationship with her. The lawsuit includes some pretty graphic claims of abuse, saying that Diddy regularly beat and kicked her, leaving her with black eyes and bruises. She also accused him of abuse and saying many of these incidents were witnessed by his loyal crew who wouldn't step in to help. She would point to two different events, where one time in 2016 Diddy abused her at a hotel, and this other time Diddy would break into her apartment and rape her in 2018. Cassie initially wanted a $30 million damage fee, but when Diddy refused to pay, she filed the lawsuit. Surprisingly, that lawsuit was settled just a day after she filed it in New York, with Diddy's lawyer saying the settlement didn't mean he did anything wrong. But here's the twist. Right after Cassie's lawsuit, two more women came forward with their own stories of abuse. One of them, Joy Dickerson Neal, filed a complaint in Manhattan, saying Diddy drugged and sexually assaulted her back in college in 1991, and he would record that attack and share it without her knowledge. This other woman, Liza Gardner, accused him of forcing her into sex in the early 90s and then choking her until she passed out. These lawsuits came right before the New York Adult Survivors Act was set to expire, which had allowed people to file claims of sexual abuse even after the normal time limits ran out. Diddy denied all the claims, and his spokesperson said the lawsuits were just a money grab. They added that the allegations from over 30 years ago filed at the last minute were all completely rejected by Diddy. But even with that, things kept getting worse. In December 2023, another woman filed a lawsuit against Diddy accusing him of trafficking and gang by him, former bad boy president Harf Pierre, and a third person back in 2003. She said they gave her a lot of drugs and alcohol before the incident, and afterward she was in so much pain that she could barely move or even remember how she got home. Diddy responded saying he didn't do any of the awful things being claimed, while Pierre called the accusations false and a desperate attempt for cash. The judge later ruled that the woman, who filed anonymously, would have to use her real name to move forward with her case. Then, in February 2024, music producer Rodney Jones Jr., who worked on Diddy's The Love Album, filed a lawsuit claiming Diddy made unwanted sexual advances and pressured him to hire prostitutes for sexual acts. In the court's documents, Jones said Diddy tried to into sleeping with another guy, saying it was normal in the music biz. So it's at this point the FBI launches an official investigation into Diddy's secret affairs. A month later, feds raided two of his mansions, one in LA and the other in Miami. They would take computers, cell phones, drugs, and ammunition found in both homes. Diddy also got stopped at the Miami airport when he was about to head to the Bahamas. He was ordered to turn over several electronic devices, but he didn't get locked up until six months later when a grand jury indicted him. According to this indictment, the feds found a thousand bottles of lubricant as part of his freak-off parties and three AR-15s inside his mansion. It also claims that Diddy and folks from the Combs Enterprise, like top managers, security, household staff, and personal assistants, helped set up these freak-offs. These parties were packed with drugs and with the hotel rooms booked and stocked with all the supplies needed like them baby oil, 
lubricants, extra linens, and lighting for those really wild nights. Diddy's crew had to clean up the rooms after these freak-offs to try to reduce room damage and arrange travel for the victims, maybe order IV fluids, and grab large amounts of cash for Diddy to allegedly pay the commercial sex workers. So during these freak-offs, Diddy also allegedly hit, kicked, threw stuff at, and dragged victims, sometimes by their hair. In essence, he would put these victims through physical, emotional, and verbal abuse to make them participate. And he kept control over his victims through various means, like physical violence, promising career opportunities, threatening to cut off financial support, and other coercive tactics, like maybe tracking their movements, controlling how they looked, monitoring their medical info. Managing their housing? How about supplying them with more drugs? Diddy would use sensitive, embarrassing recordings he made at these freak-offs as leverage and blackmail to keep the victims silent and obedient. September 16th, 2024. Diddy was arrested at a New York hotel. Now he's facing three serious charges. Racketeering, trafficking by force, fraud, or coercion, and transportation for prostitution. So we know what prison he's in and why he's in prison. But what about his life on the inside? Let's talk about it. On Diddy's first night at MDC, they gave him some Swedish meatballs with a choice of egg noodles, green beans, or a garden salad on the side. Three days, his 6 a.m. breakfast came with cereal, fruit, and a breakfast cake. Every day, he's got to be up by 6 a.m., though, have his bed made by 7.30, and mop his cell floor before he can step out. They make sure he gets three square meals a day. Lunch comes with options like scrambled eggs, burgers, baked chicken, beef tacos, or cheese pizza. For dinner, he can go with the barbecue beef, chicken fried rice, baked ziti, chili, or hot dogs all served with a beverage. Now, he's also required to share his cell with one other person, who's yet to be identified. Now, Diddy gets at least an hour a day of recreation. He gets time outside of his cell for different programs as well. He is allowed to shower three times a week and gets those daily check-ins from medical staff. There's also a psychology crew around. Plus, he gets visits from departments like education and religious services. He can send and receive mail from Monday through Friday, make his phone calls, and have visitors. But it's still up in the air if he's made any calls or even had any visitors since being locked up. Inmates like Diddy can also cop extra snacks and food, like a six-pack of Hershey's bars for seven bucks, a seasoned pork pouch for four dollars, I bought some peanut butter for three dollars and some cents. Now at first, Diddy was placed on super watch, meaning they were checking him around the clock with bright lights and cameras 24-7. Whenever a suit watch inmate leaves their cell, they get strip searched. And for inmates who are considered a danger to themselves, well, they're given rubber shoes, special utensils, and have to get clearance for things like toothbrushes. Right now, Diddy's off watch, but he's kept in the jail's special housing unit. Now, this unit is home to the infamous crypto scammer, Sam Bankman Freed, and was once home to famous names like Ghislaine Maxwell, Keith Raniere, and most recently, R. Kelly. Yeah, that's right, R&B artist R. Kelly was also locked up at MDC Brooklyn before he too was convicted of crimes in 2021. In R. Kelly's case though, the guards used his fame to make him sing for him. Hey, who knows, Diddy might be in there dropping 16 bars right now. But on a more serious note, life in there ain't nothing like the luxury Diddy used to show off on social media. With his personal chef and staff catering to his every move, this guy's known for being a fashionista, but right now he's got two prison uniforms, three pairs of socks, and most embarrassing of all, used underwear. Yeah, he has to go through at least five official inmate counts every day, which comes with regular strip searches. He's got to take off all his clothes, open that mouth, turn around, spread the cheeks, cough and squat. But hey, this happens because Diddy's a high-profile federal inmate. Now, if you're thinking his life behind bars is messed up, then I hate to break it to you because it gets worse. Right now, rumors are flying around that Diddy's scared he might get taken out while he's locked up. Word is, he thinks he's got a bullseye on his back from the West Coast gangsters looking to get payback for Tupac's death. Now, Tupac was killed back in 96, and Dwayne Keith D. Davis, the guy charged in that murder, claims that Diddy supposedly offered millions of dollars to have him taken out. Davis is throwing accusations at Diddy for over 15 years now. 
but Diddy hasn't been officially linked to any investigation about Tupac's murder. Court docs in Davis's case include a bunch of interviews he's done with cops over the last 20 years. Prosecutors even dropped a transcript from a 2009 undercover interview, where Davis repeated his claims about Diddy being tied to Tupac's murder. So on top of all of this, Diddy's worried about his safety behind bars in general, with ex-prison officials saying, Some inmates might just come for him just because of his fame. Hurting someone like Diddy could give him serious clout inside. It's like getting a badge of honor. With his celebrity status and the serious charges hanging over him, oh, he's definitely a big target. At this point, it's pretty obvious that Diddy's lifestyle right now is a whole different game compared to the luxurious setup at his $35 million, 8,000 square foot mansion in Miami, where he had private security and loved ones everywhere. But let's not get it twisted, because Diddy is quite influential and very rich. So maybe he might get some privileges back there. If he could get on the good side of some guards and maybe other prisoners, he could get better food, better time out of his cell, maybe a better outfit. Now, since his crimes came to light, people have been comparing him to billionaire creep Jeffrey Epstein, who ended up dead in his situation under his shady circumstances while waiting for trial back in 2019. Ironically, Diddy's stuck in the same Brooklyn jail where Epstein's right-hand woman, Ghislaine Maxwell, was held, after she said other inmates and guards were threatening her life. So, speculations aside, what's next for Diddy? If Diddy does get convicted, he's looking at around 15 years to life. It all really depends on whether he agrees to take a plea deal or if he goes to trial. Right now, Diddy's with his legal team, figuring out which option is best for him. But as it stands right now, as of this video, it does seem like they're willing to go to trial. Diddy's next court date is set for October 9th, 2024. So in the meantime, we guess he's probably having a tough time adjusting to his new reality.